Hello everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, say a couple of words on citizenship identity nexus in Europe, which is the topic of our first lecture in the unit two uh, of the MOOC. Um, and this uh, topic is a kind of basic topic because it introduces the main issues concerning citizenship and uh, identity. And I would start uh, with some very basic things concerning the conceptual uh, degree of and variety of uh, discussions on citizenship, which are quite uh, great in terms of uh, uh, the spectrum uh, in which the very topic of citizenship has been discussed in literature. So we have different approaches to what citizenship is. We have normative accounts of citizenship, and these accounts are mainly referring to some lost ideals of citizenship, oftentimes um, related to ancient Greek or Roman citizenship. And uh, scholars would bemoan that today's citizenship is not up to par with these older ideas. But it's a normative account, actually, right? And it's oftentimes question questionable if we really want to turn uh, our eyes on these uh, ideal types. Now, the other um, possible approach to citizenship is to concentrate on historic functional approaches, which describe citizenship as um, um, an institution, a political institution that uh, has developed with uh, some functions. For instance, in the city-states of Renaissance or already in the Middle Ages, for instance, in Italy, citizens were arm-bearing uh, people that, were, uh, that had the right to uh, bear arms and, of course, that had the obligation to defend their uh, city-states. And with this military aspect of citizenship, uh, there was this specific development of obligation and uh, defending um, the city-states. Now, uh, what is citizenship uh, then, if we have so many conceptions of citizenship and many conceptions of uh, their um, conceptual meaning? Uh, citizenship, when we take a look at this, basically is a shared membership in a political community. It relates to political community uh, and it relates to political authority. So there are two uh, aspects of it, we can say. On the one hand, there's this horizontal relationship uh, which uh, binds citizens together in a one political community, and there's the other one, the vertical relationship, which um, describes the political authority, which is equally important. And between these two aspects, we kind of maneuver in our understanding of what citizenship is, between political community and political authority. Now, another distinction is also important. And this is the distinction between the practice of citizenship and the concept of citizenship. It's quite important because we will talk about uh, different uh, concepts, different aspects, conceptual aspects, but equally important are the political experiences of citizens, which uh, need to be distinguished from the analytical categories. Uh, now I would like to uh, focus on three aspects of citizenship that are pervasive in almost every idea of what citizenship is. The first one would be rights, the other one would be obligations, and the third one would be compliance. And the compliance relates to the political authority aspect of citizenship because it binds citizens with the political authority via uh, this vertical relationship I was talking about previously. Now, uh, rights are an essential aspect of almost every conception of citizenship. They're very important, and oftentimes they're historically derived, derived from the Roman concept of citizenship, in which citizenship was a legal status. So rights were regarded as entitlements or privileges because not everyone in a community, in a public community, was equipped with rights. So in the legal sense, rights are empower citizens on the one hand, and the rights needs to be judiciable, which means that you need independent and working courts to actually uh, allow their rights to be uh, claimed and to be enjoyed by the citizens. Based on this rights concept of citizenship, we have liberal citizenship. Right? I would like to introduce this term liberal citizenship. It is liberal not in the economic sense, but in the legal sense, that it's based on, uh, on rights, on, uh, on uh, privileges, and these rights and privileges protect the citizens from arbitrary political decisions. They render the citizens free in this sense because their rights are protected through courts and in courts because citizens can invoke a law that grants them the rights. 
The third aspect of citizenship is obligations. It's equally important, and there are citizenship concepts that focus on that quite strongly. Right? If we take a look at the Aristotelian concept of citizenship, for instance, it's very obligation-based in the sense that citizens certainly enjoy certain rights, but to be citizen means even more to bear the burden of a political office, for instance. Right? And citizenship is uh, also about civic virtues, such as solidarity, loyalty, and trust, which are necessary features of living in a community. That's quite important for citizenship because the argument is that it cannot exist with obligations. So people share not only uh, rights, but also obligations in a political community. And this idea of uh, civic friendship, of a special bond among citizens, is quite important and popular uh, among Republican thinkers. Uh, uh, and the idea of that goes back to Aristotle. Right? So based on that, uh, I would argue we have this type of uh, citizenship that we might call Republican citizenship, which is based on civic participation. Right? And the civic participation is viewed as essential for the obligation aspect of citizenship because it focuses on the notion of public good. And of course, it obliges citizen to, citizens to participate and um, take uh, the responsibility for the community. Now, the third aspect that I've mentioned already by referring to the political authority uh, conception is compliance. In this aspect, in this perspective, citizens are defined not only as bearers or holders of rights or obligations, but also as subjects of political authority. And this is not something that occurs in um, authoritarian regimes, quite the opposite. It is also something that is typical for democratic citizenship because citizens also need to follow uh, political regulations. They are also subject to political rule. Of course, preferably subjects to political rule, rule that they can determine, uh, which would be a further characteristic of democratic citizenship. But this compliance aspect focuses on the survival uh, in a political community, oftentimes physical survival in view of antagonistic political conflicts, and uh, it's the guarantee that the political community can survive in crises uh, as uh, faced with threats and risks of different kind, for instance, the threat of war. Based on that, I would suggest that we um, develop and um, devise um, the type of citizenship that might be called Caesarean citizenship. And the Caesarean citizenship, because again, it's focused on political authority, describes the relationship between the citizenship and the political authority. And for that reason, it's directly connected to compliance. So the idea of that is that citizens, Caesarean citizens, understand the necessity of obedience to political authority, uh, without which there would be no civilized existence and therefore also no citizenship. So what does it all mean for identity? I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture that uh, there is this citizenship identity nexus. Nexus means that we have this connection, that we have this um, link between citizenship and identity. And we uh, can show what type of identities or types of identities are um, connected to uh, these types of citizenship that I've mentioned beforehand. So what is uh, identity about? There are different theories and different concepts of identity, specifically collective identity. But, but in the political scientific way, in this narrow normative way, it is mainly about the notion of citizenship identity. So it's not about personal identity, how people feel about themselves, how they understand themselves. It is mainly about their role and how they frame this role within the political community. So for instance, Kimlik and Norman, uh, who are two Canadian uh, political theorists, are uh, arguing that there need to be an overarching identity that uh, responds to a kind of master citizenship that is necessary to exist despite, of course, a variety of social roles, political preferences, self-government rights that are typical for diverse societies. And this overarching citizenship identity is uh, quite important, specifically for those uh, communities, but not only for those, because citizenship identity um, stabilizes them and makes them actually survive. Right? And this is oftentimes put in context with uh, another concept, which is called deep diversity, 
a concept that was coined by Charles Taylor, another Canadian uh, political theorist who said that specifically this overarching identity needs somehow to uh, be able to integrate these different uh, cultural, uh, national and ethnic structures in a diverse society. Now, I would suggest that we uh, develop uh, different uh, ideas about identity based on the models of citizenship that I've talked about. Right? So we have the liberal model, the republican model, and the Caesarean model. And the idea behind that is that every model of citizenship is connected to some specific uh, type of identity. Uh, and we will reduce this to one aspect. Right? More about this you can read in the literature that I um, um, gave you to read, and, uh, but let, because it's a very short lecture, we will concentrate on this one aspect, which is weak and strong identity. And weak and strong identity does not only mean uh, the actual strength of identity and the commitment of the people to the others, but it has to be political. So we, we are talking all the time about political identity, which is uh, probably different from sociological and psychological ideas that have been around for some time. Right? So the liberal model of uh, citizenship, I would argue, is associated with a weak collective identity. Why? Because liberal citizens live in a society of individuals. So it's an individual society, which is also a political community to some extent, of course, but participation or obligations vis-a-vis -vis the others are not necessary. They're not, they are there, but they're not constitutive for being a citizen. We're still individuals, we decide based on our, on our individual preferences rather than um, shared uh, community preferences. And politics is merely one of a number of various areas in which citizens construct a broad spectrum of preferences, hence weak collective identity. And this collective identity is quite important because um, in a liberal model of citizenship, uh, you cannot expect strong uh, collective identity. And if you expect strong collective identity and even try to impose such, there will be problematic consequences. In liberal societies, strong um, collective identities will uh, backfire and will cause problems of different kind. Now, uh, in contrast, the republican model of citizenship requires not only civic altruism, if you like, or civic friendship that I've mentioned uh, with this republican model of citizenship, but also basic civic commitment to public interest. So the idea of republicanism or republican citizenship is that people uh, are not merely individuals. They stop being individuals uh, prior to important decisions uh, in the public sphere. So whenever there are elections, whenever there are political discussions in the public sphere, they need to transform somehow from individuals to citizens. And there is even more, if you like, in some versions of this republican model, there is a cult of commoners. Right? Citizens come together in a public space, private matters are excluded, you cannot discuss private matters. If you talk about politics, you need to justify your preferences and your arguments with uh, reference to what a public space uh, can be, uh, how public space can be understood. So we have uh, here the case of strong and resilient collective identity, at least in the model. I'm not talking about the political practice but rather the analytical aspect of it. And this strong and resilient collective identity is uh, the side effect, if you like, of Republican model of citizenship. Now, the last one that I would like to focus is the Caesarean model of citizenship. That is hardly collective identity in the political sense. Right? It is collective identity, of course, but it's not based on political understanding of it. Instead, it's about homogeneity with regard to common perceptions of danger and insecurity, because political community is to protect the citizens from those risks, from those threats that I have mentioned. And collectivism is a kind of response to insecurity, provoking attempts of reaffirmation of identity in order to decrease insecurity and existential anxiety. So it's not really political. It might be strong if this Caesarean um, um, model of citizenship is uh, Mm, placed at the center of the political uh, public space, uh, but it's not political uh, at the center. So we have these three different types of citizenships and uh, corresponding identities, and the question is now what it all means. Uh, well, it would mean, for instance, that um, 
we cannot expect different types of identities when it comes to specific models of citizenship. So the argument is, with liberal model of citizenship, we need to expect we collective identity. With Republican model of citizenship, we collective identity will be a problem, of course. It will be disturbance in the political. It will be disturbance of citizenship, if you like. And with the Caesarean model of citizenship, uh, equally, similarly to what I've said before, there is strong collective identity, but not political. Now, all these uh, models of, citizenships, uh, of citizenship and corresponding identity can occur at the same time. So if we take a look at citizenship identity nexus in the European Union, which is a very interesting case because it's not a state, it's not a nation state, it's a supranational organization, but still there is something that we call European citizenship. It's a type of transnational citizenship that, um, as I argue, has been a mixture of the Caesarean and the liberal models. So it's a very interesting type of, uh, of uh, mixture of these two types. And I argue that originally in the European community, as the European Union uh, called itself beforehand, many years ago, uh, the Caesarean model of citizenship was the point of departure for European citizenship because it was established as a peacekeeping mechanism to prevent war in Europe. That was the idea, that was the narrative in the very beginning. And then there was the so-called permissive consensus. It meant that European integration, European community, European Union were based on uh, decisions by the elites. And citizens were virtually excluded from the decision-making process. And that's an interesting part because, so goes the argument, it was approved by the citizens themselves. They kind of ruled out themselves, at least in theory, if you like, but things changed in the beginning of the 1990s where more liberal aspects were introduced into the European community. Right? Um, already in the 1970s, there was a decision to discuss mobility for students, there was the exchange of teachers and harmonization of diplomas. In, an, in the 1990s, um, there was, of course, the question of free mobility across the borderless uh, um, uh, uh, boundaries of the European Union between the states which was liberal because it was about freedom, about liberty, it was about uh, moving around. So the idea of mobility as a basic right of European uh, citizens was central to this. So we have this mixture of Caesarean uh, ideas, ideas that uh, think uh, the European Union should be a kind of uh, protective uh, political community and should concentrate on that with liberal ideas about individual um, freedom, individual rights of the citizens, mainly concerning the uh, mobility rights across the borderless, uh, not really borderless, it's got the controlless borders of the European Union. Now, we don't have much of the Republican citizenship, which is an interesting aspect, I think. Uh, there are not many obligations uh, in the European citizenship. There's not any traditional civic sense vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. We can see that with uh, low turnout rates in uh, European elections, for instance. The EU does not require any substantive public engagement from European citizens, so it's still underdeveloped. So the consequence of that is that with Caesarean and liberal uh, citizenship models, we cannot really expect a very strong and very resilient identity because it doesn't fit, right? There is a mismatch, if you like, between these models of citizenship that have evolved in the European Union and our sometimes uh, uh, overambitious expectations of identity. Now, let me uh, come to the summary of what I've been talking about. So, first of all, citizenship includes identity. That's the argument. Citizenship is not just an institution. It's not just a status that describes rights and obligations. It has consequences for identity. How people see themselves vis-a-vis -vis the others in a political community. So it makes sense to debate, to discuss identity in the context of citizenship. Now, I argued that uh, we should differentiate liberal, republican and Caesarean citizenship. Of course, it's just a proposal. There are many other uh, ideas about how um, to go about these models of citizenship, but it's one of, uh, uh, of ideas that are, I think, quite convincing when we take a look at different sectors of the European Union specifically, uh, because there in these sectors of European Union uh, we will find different citizenship identity requirements, if you like. And the last point that I would like to, main, uh, main, made is to make is that the EU is a mixture of liberal and Caesarean citizenship identity. And uh, this mixture, this differentiation, 
reflects quite well the very nature of the European Union. Why? Because the European Union is largely about differentiated integration. It means that different countries, different societies are integrated into the system to a ver varying degrees and you cannot expect a homogeneous effect, uh, which is sometimes expected uh, in the context of a nation state. Uh, that would be it. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you will enjoy uh, the rest of the unit too. Thank you.